morning, everyone. Welcome to day eight of the organometallics class. Today, we'll pick up where we left off and wrap up discussion of carbenes and other metal, mul metal carbon multiply bonded species and uh, related variants thereof. As a reminder, last time we concluded the lecture with a brief overview of the different classes of metal carbenes. Namely, the two key subtypes, Fischer and Schrock type, we emphasize that these represent endpoints of a continuum of, of structure and electronic configuration and reactivity. And then within the Fischer subtype, we considered a few special cases, including carbonoid, vinylidine, and NHC. Now we'll take a deeper dive into each of these subtypes, particularly the Fischer, the Schrock, and the NHC series, and examine how um, these look from electronic perspective and then uh, how to synthesize them and what type of reactivity they exhibit. First, let's consider Fischer carbenes. So as a reminder, these are the case where the metal carbon double bond is polarized in such a way that the metal is, is uh, delta minus and the carbon atom is delta plus and thus electrophilic. From a molecular orbital diagram perspective, Fischer carbenes involve a bonding interaction between a the filled orbital on the carbene, which is the non-bonding sp2 hybridized orbital, uh, into donation of that uh, filled orbital into an unoccupied orbital on the, the metal of appropriate symmetry, say the dz squared or dx squared minus y squared, and then back donation of a filled d orbital on the metal into the empty P orbital on the carbene. In terms of reactivity, we would expect Fischer carbenes based on the polarization mapped here on the top left to favor uh, reaction with organic coupling partners such that nucleophiles will attack on carbon and electrophiles will be attacked by the metal. Fischer carbenes are often formed uh, as 18 electron complexes, often D6, observed most commonly with late transition metals in a low oxidation state. And the metal here, because um, it is at a low oxidation state and has um, multiple D electrons is typically stabilized by pi accepting ligands. Most commonly here we see CO as the pi accepting ligand. The carbene is stabilized by heteroatom groups directly attached to carbon. And that's due to the fact that heteroatom groups that possess a lone pair or in the case of aromatic substituents, electron density in the pi cloud that can donate electron density into the unoccupied p orbital of carbon, thereby stabilizing it. Overall, because in part because of this stabilization, the bond between the metal and carbon is relatively weak. And we'll see how this manifests in terms of bond distance as a proxy for bond strength momentarily. In terms of electron counting, when we see a Fischer carbene, we think of it as an L-type ligand. And one way to represent a Fischer carbene that emphasizes the fact that it is weak, that the metal carbon bond is weak, and also that the interaction is L-type, is that we can draw it like, like this as a, as a data interaction.
Now, in the case of shock carbenes, almost everything is flip-flopped here. Now we have an electrophilic metal. We have a nucleophilic carbon. In terms of an MO depiction, we have the carbene being triplet state as opposed to singlet state in the Fischer carbene case. And thus the non-bonding sp2 hybridized orbital of the carbene and the uh, orthogonal p orbital are each singly occupied forming bonding interactions with singly occupied orbitals of appropriate symmetry on the metal. When a Schrock type carbene engages an organic substrate, the carbogenic group now will act as a nucleophile and engage electrophilic por uh, portion of the substrate. And then the metal by virtue of being electrophilic will be attacked by whatever nucleophilic components are present in solution. Schrock carbenes are commonly 14 or 16 electron with D0 or D2 metals. Here we're talking about early transition metals, often in high oxidation state. In this case, now the metal is stabilized by strong sigma donor ligands in contrast to the Fischer carbene case where we saw that high accepting ligands like CO are stabilizing. In this archetypal Schrock carbene case, this uh, neopencil tantalum species shown on the upper left, uh, we see that the strong sigma donor ligands are the alkyl uh, groups. And of course, that strong sigma donating character is helpful for stabilizing the high oxidation state. Now we see that if we were to insert a heteroatom onto the carbene, that would be highly destabilizing because you could imagine in a case where we try to have a, a group with a lone pair on it, it's trying to provide electron density into an orbital that's already partially filled, and that would be destabilizing. As a result, Schrock carbenes typically just have a simple uh, H substituent, two H substituents, or alkyl substituents. In the case of H substituents, we call them methylidines, CH2. In the case of alkyl substituents, we call them alkylides. Now the metal carbon bond is strong, and we'll see that reflected in the metal carbon bond distance as measured by X-ray crystallography. In terms of electron counting, we count these as X2 ligands, or sometimes, as I like to think about it, double Grignards. Um, they're double alkyl, not, not double Grignards, double alkyl ligands that are tethered uh, as, the same, as the same moiety. NHCs, as we covered briefly at last class, that stands for N-heterocyclic carbenes. These are a special class of Fischer carbenes, or as Bob Crabtree describes them in his textbook, they're Fischer carbenes on, on steroids. And what does that mean? Well, that's referring to the fact that now instead of just one flanking heteroatom, you actually have two flanking heteroatoms, both with lone pairs, both of which can donate electron density into that unfilled P orbital. In the context of catalysis, these generally act as spectators, very much in line with how phosphines play a role in catalysis. They don't directly themselves participate in the action, but they too in the steric and electronic properties of the metal and thus affect features like turnover frequency, turnover number, prox selectivity, et cetera. Like phosphines, they're strong sigma donors and relatively weak pi acceptors. In fact, they're actually weaker pi acceptors than phosphines, though this has been the subject of some debate in the literature. They are some to, uh, NHCs are sometimes referred to as Arduango or Wanslick type carbenes, and that's in a 
acknowledgement or in recognition of the fact that the very first family of stable carbenes uh, mm -hmm. that are monomeric uh, that was published by Arduango in the early 1990s. The original reference is, is shown here. And so in this NN bis adamantyl case, which was the first case uh, where a free carbene had been successfully synthesized, we see in the resulting crystal structure, not only that the carbene is monomeric, that's of course important to establish, but also the bond angle here uh, between the two carbon uh, nitrogen bonds of 102.2 is consistent with the singlet character of this carbene. So as we said, most carbenes, when we consider carbenes as ligands, they are unusual in that most carbenes are not stable in the absence of metal coordination. But an exception here are these stable Arduango type and heterocyclic carbenes. In terms of ligand substitution, uh, NHCs have an even stronger trans effect than phosphines and, and, and stronger trans influence than, than phosphines, which themselves are already quite strongly trans influencing ligands. And because these are a subtype of Fischer carbenes, we treat them as L-type when we do electron counting. Now let's jump into the synthesis and reactivity. Let's go back in time now more than uh, 60 years, or I guess a, a little bit less than, roughly 60 years, to the mid 1960s and take a look at the very first synthesis of what are now called Fischer carbenes from the group of Fischer himself. So the synthesis begins with a relatively simple tungsten precursor, tungsten hexacarbonyl, which we have in our lab. We've used uh, many times in the context of our group's research in bovalent tungsten catalysis. Upon treatment with methyl lithium, a new adduct is formed where the overall species is anionically charged and we form a new tungsten acyl group where the um, anionic methyl um, is engaging one of the electrophilic carbons of the carbonyl ligands. Now, as I've drawn it here on the top, we see the, the, the metal bearing the negative charge, but in reality, this can exist as two resonance forms. The other resonance form would be we donate the electrons from the metal to the form a, a double bond to between the metal and the carbon, and then push the electron density from the carbonyl onto oxygen to give a new oxyanion. And this starts to look vaguely reminiscent to what we see in carbonyl chemistry. Now, upon treatment of this species, which is existing in these two resonance forms, we see O-alkylation with a strong methyl electrophile to give the new adduct shown here, which is the Fischer carbon. Let's take a look at one other example. Now we're considering a chromium hexacarbonyl complex. Our nucleophile in this case is LDA. At the outset, that might feel a little bit uncomfortable because typically we think of LDA as being a sterically bulky base with relatively low nucleophilicity. But I'll just get to the crux and sit, crux of this um, reaction and say that these carbonyl ligands are relatively sterically unencumbered if you think about how they exist in, in three-dimensional space. And so even though this is not a particularly strong nucleophile and is, and is sterically encumbered, it is still able to engage one of the carbonyl ligands co that's coordinated to chromium to form a new carbon-nitrogen bond. And then we apply the same sequence as above, in this case, trap with ethyl electrophile to get a new Fischer carbene complex. We can take a look at the x-ray crystal structure data 
for the parameters that come from the extracrystal structure in this case. And we see a bond distance between chromium and carbon of 3.13 angstroms. That's relatively long by the standards of carbon metal double bonds. In fact, it's much more in the range of a carbon metal single bond or carbon chromium single bond. You can see that uh, those typically fall in the range of 2.0 to 2.2 angstroms. And that goes hand in hand with what we said previously, that these are typically, Fischer carbines are typically weakly bonded in terms of carbon metal bonding. The Fischer carbine here can exist in multiple resonance forms in addition to the one drawn here. And so if we push arrows this way, delocalize the lone pair from oxygen to form a double bond between oxygen and carbon. Now we push electrons from that metal carbon double bond onto chromium. And that would give us to this form. And then if we instead push the lone pair from nitrogen, form a double carbon nitrogen double bond, um, then that would give us this one. And in reality, these are all resonance contributors that account for stabilization. Okay, let's consider problem of the day number one from the day seven handout. Let me pull up that worksheet. This question asks us to consider the pKa's of the three species shown. Methyl acetate and is a number one, Roman numeral one. The Roman numeral two is a representative Fischer carbene. And Roman numeral three is a representative Schrock carbene. And in all cases, we're considering the pKa of the alpha CH bond. So methyl in the case of methyl acetate, and then uh, right along the series. So take a minute, I think this one should be pretty fast. Take, take just a minute to jot down your impression and then um, I'll, I'll go through the correct answers. Okay, so we need to order these three. And the first two to consider are, are, are probably to, to think about the comparative acidity of the Fischer carbene versus the Schrock carbene. We said at the outset that Fischer type carbenes are carbonyl light. And, and we saw above their synthesis um, looking similar to carbonyl chemistry. So that might be a signal to us that the alpha CH bonds might be relatively acidic. We consider in contrast the Schrock carbene character. Remember that the carbon atom of a Schrock carbene has strong carb anionic character. So do you think that it would be favorable or non-favorable to build up anionic charge adjacent to something that already has a strong delta minus character? Probably not. So we can order these just based on that reasoning and say that the pKa of the Schrock carbene is going to be much higher than that of the Fischer carbene. Now, how does the these, how do these two compare to 
simple methyl acetate, that might not intrinsically be obvious, whether the carbon metal double bond is going to end up being more acidifying or less acidifying than the CO double bond. And I'll, I'll just cut right to the chase and say that it ends up being more acidifying. And we'll put numbers on that in just, just a moment. And so remember here that these pKa measurements are not just a measure of how electronegative the atom is, oxygen versus chromium, but also, more importantly, how effectively that atom can stabilize negative charge. And also remember that if chromium in this case has multiple CO ligands, all of which are pi accepted, they can delocalize the negative charge across many atoms. Okay, let's put some numbers on these pKa differences. Esters and amides, you probably know this right, right off the bat. We can ballpark these 25 and 30 respectively. And then if we consider the metalloester or metalloamide form, here there'll be a, a range, of course, but the metal ends up having an acidifying effect relative to the oxygen constituent. And that manifests itself mm -hmm. in terms of a multiple pKa unit drop. You see in both cases, the pKa changes by more than 10 pKa units. So it's significantly more acidic. And to ballpark this, remember that phenol is just one example, has a, the OH has a pKa of, of around 10. So metalloesters of Fischer carbines are in that range in terms of the reactivity here is very much ester-like. So if we subject the Fischer carbene to a new incoming alcohol in the presence of a suitable acid or base catalyst, we will see transesterification, just as you would with a non metalloester a simple ester. And then likewise, if we react an ester with a suitably nucleophilic amine with or without catalyst, then we can get exchange OR group for an incoming nitrogen substituent. Okay, let's take a look at a specific example here where we'll react this chromium Fischer carbene complex first with LDA. Before moving on, I should ask are there any questions? on this first part, okay. Before we saw LDA engaging as a nucleophile, one of the carbonyls of a metal carbonyl complex, but that was in a case where there was no acidic CH bonds to, to speak of. Now we have acidic CH bonds. They're going to be prone to rapid participation in acid base chemistry. So LDA here will deprotonate the acidic CH bond. And then taking this one step further, just reacting with a generic electrophile. Think here like methyl iodide, for example, that will result in alpha function. More interesting case comes when we consider ethylene oxide as an electrophile. Here now, upon carbon-carbon bond formation, we form a tethered oxyanion, which if we squinted our eyes and just thought in terms of carbonyl chemistry, and we had an ester that had a tethered 
alkoxy group, we would immediately think about cyclization to form a lactone. In this case, we will have cyclization to form a metallolactone. Draw that out. Missing my oxygen. There we go. And then we have one additional step here where we're going to take this metallolactone and react with DMDO, other oxidants such as bivalent cerium salts can play the same role. And this will result in cleavage of the Fischer carbon corresponding lactone, a concomitant generation of the chromium carbonyl oxygen. So this transformation um, is synthetically enabling, but already here we get hints at what is going to be challenging if we were to want to render this stoichiometric reaction or this reaction that is stoichiometric in the metal promoter to catalytic. Here in this sequence, we're generating a metal oxo, which provides strong thermodynamic driving force. If we wanted to render this catalytic, we would think of, need to think of a way to convert that metal oxo, which is way thermodynamically downhill, back to the reactive form, which is a major challenge. Okay, let's consider one more reactivity mode now, that of um, engagement between a Fischer carbene and a alkene, in this case, an a alkene bearing a resonance electron withdrawn. Now, one of the things to remember that we highlighted above is a lot of Fischer carbene complexes are 18 electrons. So to get to a reactive form, they will first need to lose a ligand, in this case, lose a CO ligand, to get to the reactive 16 electron form. Now, in this case, the 16 electron form of the catalyst with CO having been lost or, or whatever other flanking ligand is present can engage in the incoming alkene via a two plus two metallocycloaddition. Whether you think about this as being a concerted process or a stepwise process, either way you would get to the same regiochemical outcome that I have, have drawn. And based on the data that's available, this is believed to in many cases be a, I shouldn't say all, generalized to say all case, but in many cases, um, at most cases thought to be a concerted process. I'm sure there are some exceptions to this rule. That gives a new metallocyclopropane. And there are several fates that can happen from this metallocyclopropane. As you can imagine, this could undergo beta hydride elimination. This could undergo retro two plus two, either in a degenerate fashion to give the starting materials or in a productive fashion to give a new alkene product, as we will see later in Wolf metathesis. But another pathway is that these metallocyclobutanes can undergo CC reductive elimination, and that's what happens in this, in this case, and commonly happens with classical Fischer carbons. So here we will form a new bond between the two carbon atoms highlighted in yellow. That closes the three-membered ring. We then need to stabilize the reduced metal, um, and we do so by reassociating the ligand that was lost uh, initially. <coughs> when the 18 electron complex activated to, to form the 16 electron form. Any questions on that? So one of the points that I'll leave you to ponder in the 
over the next week or so before we jump into the Olaf metathesis lecture is we see that these classical Fisher carbenes bearing the classical ligand sets of carbonyl ligand are prone to cyclopropanation. And note here too that the cyclopropanation that takes place, this is not a nitrinoid, or sorry, a carbonoid type cyclopropanation that's outer sphere. Uh, mechanistically, this is distinct. Nevertheless, these Fischer carbenes are prone to cyclopropanation. If we were to want to suppress that and favor the retro two plus two, then how would we do that if we wanted to design an effective old metathesis catalyst? That will be the question we'll confront. So now let's turn attention to problem of the day number two from the day seven handout. This asks us to consider the reaction shown below between this furanyl fischer carbene complex and the propargilic alcohol, the sile ether form of this propargilic alcohol shown. And as a, as a prelude to this, I'll note that this step was used as a key transformation in the synthesis of the natural product kelin or kalin, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. So take a minute to think about this. Um, this, I will, I will say ahead of time, this is a fairly mechanistically complex process. So take time to give this some thought, discuss with your neighbor, and then we will reconvene as a class to go through what we what we think is most likely. And another point that I wanna make here is that this combination of acetic anhydride and base, don't get distracted by this. This is going to result in a late stage or an isolation of a late stage intermediate. It is not involved at all in the early steps of the catalytic cycle. So uh, we're gonna make something that gets isolated at the end um, but outside of that, you can just disregard that. So don't, don't be distracted by, by um, those, those reagents as a, as a hint. All right, take a minute to think about it and then we'll discuss. Okay, let's go ahead and get some thoughts on paper. If, you, if you're not done, that's fine, but let's just um, pool, our, pool our thoughts here. Jun Tao, help, help get us started. What's going on in this transformation? Well, I think first uh, it might be a two plus two. Okay. What would be the two, two component? One is the alkyne, what would be the other? The carbene. <coughs> the, Carbene, okay. Oh, I see. Uh, <coughs> initial two plus two, got it. Okay, and then, and then, what are we going to get to as a as a product eventually? Sure. Was anyone able to get to the product here that we could put up to help orient everybody? Any guesses? Acyl enolate. Acyl enolate, is that what you said? Oh, acyl enolate? Yeah. That is along the right line of, of thinking, for sure. And Philip, did you have it? I don't know, I was just thinking of it, like thinking about the cyclo addition, then would be the purine more likely to undergo four plus two then? Okay. So the overall process that we're going to have here is a three plus two plus one. So let's draw that out. One, two, three, four, five, and then 
the one component comes from one of these carbon atoms. Those are the six atoms. Draw out the product here. It might look a little bit bizarre, but Nathan, if you could uh, check to make sure we don't get this structure completely wrong. In so doing, derail the discussion. That would be great. And this is a name reaction called the uh, Wolf, the two Fs. Dutz reaction named after the German chemist Dutz and then Wolf, who is still active at Michigan State University. First observed by um, Dutz and then developed into a practical synthetic method by the Wolf Laboratory over many, many years. Incidentally, that's the lab that Brendan Smith, our colleague from Pills Lab, uh, worked in as an undergrad. Okay, so I think there were some great initial steps here to get us started. Common theme here that if you want to do intersphere chemistry, you first need to lose a CO ligand. So let's lose that CO ligand. Now you have a vacant coordination site. Jun Tao got us started by saying, think two plus two, two plus two as the first step. Here you have a decision to make in terms of the regiochemistry. Are you going to do that metallo two plus two with the um, metal connected to um, the four or the five labeled carbon atoms here? And a priori, you might not have a clear idea whether this is going to be sterically controlled or electronically controlled. So electronically controlled, and you might think that that is a reasonable thing to think because um, I just told you that these Fischer carbines are reacting like carbonyl compounds. So that would not be an unreasonable thing to think. But I'll just tell you that all of the available evidence in the literature is that these processes are typically sterically controlled. And that's, I think, because many of the early steps are reversible um, and that the product determining step ends up happening from the most stable intermediate that is formed. Okay, so we have this metallo two plus two, I hope I drew it right, where the small group ends up forming a bond, the small alkyne ends up forming, the carbon with a small substituent ends up forming a new CC bond at the carbene carbon atom, which is doubly substituted. Then we have a retro two plus two. So let me push arrows in case that's helpful. To give a new carbene substituent, and this can undergo what is effectively a one one migratory insertion to give a ketene. Now we've decreased our number of CO ligands from four to three because we've incorporated one of them. And then the last step, which will be a little bit hard to see, I'll try to draw the highlight the atoms involved, is a six pi that is believed to take place without metal involvement. That assembles everything except the acyl group. So typical signaling element for a Dutz reaction in a retrosynthetic sense is a very highly substituted, look, in this case, hexa-substituted, differentially hexa-substituted phenol. And you can think about in a retrosynthetic sense, considering a Dutz reaction, a Wolf-Dutz reaction.
And this chemistry I always like to highlight in the class because our former TA Van Tran once told me it's her favorite name reaction in all of in all of chemistry. So there, there we go. Okay, any questions on that before we move on? I realize I went through that quickly. So did you mean when you said sterics dominate specifically for the Jones simulation or for all specifically for this reaction? Yeah, is there another question? Is there a reason why the carbonyl insertion takes place at that exact stage? Why is it not taking place earlier? Uh, why is it not taking place like at what, what other stage could it take place? Before the retro to plus two. Before the retro two plus two. Oh, I see. Um, I think if you were to, oh, so you would want to insert there and get to a, um, a cyclic ketone. Is that what you were thinking? I see. Um, that is an interesting possibility. I think if you, you can you can also insert there and you will get to an acyl metal intermediate that can then you can push arrows to get to the same. Um, intermediate as, as this one. I think it is drawn that way some, sometimes. Because a lot of, as I said, a lot of the early steps, I think everything up until the dissociation followed by six pi is reversible, then you could imagine inserting and deinserting at multiple junctures. Yeah. Good. Any other questions on that? Question okay, let's consider some shock type carbene synthesis and reactivity now, con uh, continuing on this theme. Uh, we covered the synthesis of the very first shock carbene by Schrock himself during his days at DuPont in a previous lecture. We won't rehash the details, but as a refresher, the key point was that we could take this dialkyl, dial dichloro tantalum precursor. We treat with excess neopentalithium. We get to a per neopental tantalum species that can then undergo single bond metathesis, spit out neopentane to get to uh, the, the, the Schrock um, uh, carbene shown. And I realize I have one too few, if you caught the error here. And so in terms of some benchmark, structural benchmarking, this is not the exact same complex, but similar enough that the key point holds is, is now take note of the difference in metal carbon bond length between the, this archetypal shock type carbene and the Fisher carbene, much shorter. We have almost an internal standard here because this specific complex here contains a carbon, uh, a metal uh, methyl bond, it's 2.24 angstroms, and then the methylidine, which is much shorter at 2.03 angstroms, suggesting a stronger bond. And these are some of the features. Remember that when this work was going on, there was no such thing as Schrock type and, and Fisher type. Schrock published this paper. And at that time, the whole universe of carbene structure and reactivity was, was the Fisher type. And he noted some of these structural differences. Remember, Fisher type carbenes, low, low valent, low oxidation state metal, many pi acceptance against Q. Everything's turned on its head, and you have a very short carbon metal bond. So that was the, the signaling element that there's something different going on, it's fundamentally different going on in these complexes. Okay, let's take a dive now into reactivity. And to do that, we'll consider problem of the day number three from the day seven handout.
This one, um, I think I've redrawn all of the key steps here. It's essentially a, a, a fill in the blank and then also uh, provide names for complexes B and C. I think we can gain some momentum together. So I'll just give you 15 seconds to, if we work on it together, so I'll give you 15 seconds to think about it and then we'll jump in. Okay, Annabelle, help me on um, these here. What's the name of this complex? Do you know? No, okay. What would happen if I treat this complex with the Lewis base? Okay, let's draw that out. So lone pair on Lewis base. We're gonna break up this cluster. Generate a methylidine, two CPs, and then the byproduct, which I'll just draw off to the side here, will be the aluminum dimethyl chloride, and then Lewis base atom. And the Lewis base here uh, can be, just as some examples, this can be pyridine, even a catalytic one used for THF. Okay, very good. Anyone wanna provide an assist with the name here? Debbie reagent, good. And then let's go down the other branch of this tree here. Um, Christine, what do you think? Methyl lithium, <clears throat> I'll provide a little hint here. Two equivalents of methyl lithium with CP. Oh, I realize I'm missing two here. CP2 titanium dichloride. What do we think? two organometallic reagents reacting with one another where the two metals involved have very different electronegativities. I'm not sure with the chlorides be swapped. You've got it, all right, beautiful. You're not sure, but you are sure. Transmetallation, we're generating lithium chloride, strong thermodynamic driving force. And this reagent is called Tassis reagent. Tebby reagent, you treat with Lewis base, and that gets you to the active methylidine. Potassis reagent, you heat, it generates upon heating methane. Of course, is lost to the gas, and that gets you to a common intermediate. <clears throat> One of the advantages of the potassis is that it provides this all in one convenience, and that if you are thinking about transferring groups beyond methyl, let's say in ethyl or propyl, all that you need is a to change the input of the organolithium. Organolithiums are much easier to come by than the corresponding tri-alkyl aluminums with structurally diverse alkyl groups. So that's one of the, one of the advantages there. 
Okay, now we're here. We've got the titanium methylidine. We're going to react it with uh, ketone. I'll draw out the leave some space here to draw out the key intermediate. Uh, what do you think here, Elin? Two plus two. Okay, metallo two plus two. And that will give, let's see if I'm able to draw this correctly. Okay, that's the key intermediate, I think, if, I, if I've drawn it right. And then what, what next? Elin? So what will the key Beautiful. Titanium oxide. And what else is the byproduct? So Beautiful. Essentially a illid illid transfer plus titanium oxide as a the byproduct. This was titanium oxide. <coughs> we can appreciate, maybe I should draw this as CP, so you know that the CP ligands aren't lost here. CP. Okay, and what is the difference between this and a normal Wittig reaction. You normally do Wittig reaction on ester? Ah, no. So that's the difference is that the potassus or Tebi route provides more juice, more oomph, because you have such a strong thermodynamic driving force of formation of the metal oxo. And you have a reagent that is intrinsically more kinetically reactive. <clears throat> that you can methenylate uh, esters, amides, et cetera. So that's the synthetic utility that these reagents offer. Okay, let's consider, dig a little bit deeper into reactivity here. So we already, let's consider the bottom row now. We already said that Treating Tebi reagent with Lewis base is going to get us to this active methylidine. Now, reaction with norbornene. Are there any nor norbornene superfans from Jinquan's group? Any meta selective CH activators? What do you think? There. Nobody? No takers? <laughs> Hannah, what do you think? Two plus two. Beautiful. Two plus two. Got it. And then what might happen next? Uh, this form the cyclo -propane. You could, okay, that is a, a good idea, but I'll just tell you that does not happen. And part of the reason I think, well, there might be multiple reasons, but I'll tell you that does not happen. Reductive elimination from a um, high oxidation state titanium species is not di alkyl reformation, not that uh, chemically facile. But what did we see before when we got to these metalla 
reductive elimination was one thing we saw could happen, and then the other was was what? That, and then you reacted again with this. Aha. Uh -huh. First, retro two plus two. To, to ring open this. I have to get this right because this is from my postdoc supervisor. I don't know rest in peace. Okay, so retro two plus two here is favored, as I said, for several reasons, but one is that it's strain relieving. And then I think Hannah said that we can now engage another molecule of norborneine via two plus two. And what would happen then if we just kept adding more and more and more and more norborne? We would we would do what? Glimmerized. Okay, beautiful. We would get polymorph norborne. And this is one of the very early examples of what's called a living polymerization, where the reactive form is essentially, the, the reactive catalyst is intact at the end of a propagating polymer chain. You know, if you make block copolymers this way, because you dose in one monomer, it reacts to completion, but you still have the reactive tail, dose in another monomer, it will react to completion ad infinitum. Did I misdraw anything, Nathan? Okay, another recent example with some synthetic relevance comes from the lab of Jim Friedrich at Florida State. I just highlight this because um, even though this on the surface looks like it's somewhat old fashioned chemistry, there are still lots of interesting twists left to be uncovered and understood. So here's a cool example from Friedrich lab. They take in situ generated titanium methylidine react with the alkene to generate titanocyclobutane. And then what they observed is that if you treat this intermediate with a pro proton that's, or a, an acid that's sufficiently acidic, you can proto-demetylate both of the carbon titanium bonds. In so doing, you break up that metallocyclobutane into a geminal dimethyl group. And then look what happened in the overall transformation. You've taken an alkene and in an anti Markov, in a Markovnikov selective sense, hydromethylated it. And there's um, this, I think, nicely complements some state of the art methods by, by the Baron Lab, among, um, among others. Theory. Yes. Um, following like the logic that you previously said about potassium and how you can get different titanium alkylating yeah. alkylating complexes, has that been employed for this to get just hydroalkylation in a general sense, and maybe even have like chiral titanium ligands so that you can get an antiopure, um, you know, quaternary centers? Yeah, great idea. I I think I asked somebody from their group when I met with them about it, and I think it's ongoing it's not been published yet by them so that was stage of development that really is powerful. it is more challenging because now you're 
you're more hindered at every step. You're more hindered in the initial metallo um, cyclo addition. You're more hindered in the proto demetallation. And there, uh, there are things that can go wrong that make it not a straightforward extension. And then to your point about doing it in selectively with the chiral ligand, for example, like the Britzinger bis CP ligand, also a very good idea. I think that would start to, um, you would probably want to simultaneously start thinking about how you would turn, turn this over catalytically. Because if you're taking chiral information and you're generating stoichiometric waste with it, that's arguably an inefficient path to go. So again, the theme with the, the Fisher carbine and the Schrock type carbine is that you generate stoichiometric byproducts that where there's no straightforward way to reconvert them into the active form. In this case, thermodynamic driving force is formation of two titanium oxygen bonds that are strong in the form of, um, of TFA ligands. So that is a challenge. Have, these, have the reactions been rendered catalytic in the past? And if so, how do they turn it over? Like those titanium oxo species? Just super strong. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me let, let let's let's revisit that when we when we um, consider um, olefin metathesis and its sister or brother reaction uh, of carbonyl olefin metathesis. And I think that will be a fruitful discussion then. Okay, and and let's then round out this discussion of structure reactivity of. Of, of carbenes, um, but considering what I call, I like to think of as borderline cases. Now, this is not strictly speaking like uh, what you find in the textbook, but this is how I view the view the world. So that's the that's my caveat here. These borderline cases, I I think are are common with group eight metals, and you see them with ruthenium and osmium. And to me, the diagnostic feature is that they're a form of carbene that have schizophrenic reactivity. They don't know if they're nucleophilic or electrophilic at the metal or carbon. And in practice, they are in between. It turns out this feature is not, is not a, a, a or this, this property is not a bug, but a feature. And it can be exploited in the context of most notably olefin. Um, metathesis uh, for, for complexes that are very chemoselective for engaging um, olefins. So let's consider this um, interesting osmium uh, methylidine complex from the, um, the group of Warren Roper. Uh, Warren Roper did a lot of pioneering studies on these borderline uh, cases that were preludes to Ruthenium uh, wolf metathesis systems that we know and love today. Not all of the details here are super important. You don't need to consider, for example, how the NO ligand is binding and some of these details. But let's just let's just focus on big picture. So um, the first step that we need is to generate the carbene, uh, and and how might we do that from the precursor drawn? So we talked about ways to make carbenes, but I want to generate it from this precursor shown. Shenghua, what do you think? Uh, not not entirely sure. I'm thinking maybe something like diazomethane. Beautiful, diazomethane. Great source of carbene. If you don't mind, some risk of explosion. And then and then. Look at this, we've got a um, bond distance here that is on the short end. So we're thinking that would make you think shock type, but then the, the rest of the ligands, the, you know, the oxidation state, then you're kind of thinking that looks more Fisher-like. So what's, what's going on? Here? And these are what Warren Roper refers to as, as metallo olefin. So we said Fisher type carbenes are carbonyl like shock type carbenes are illid like Borderline cases are metallo-olefin. So here's the schizophrenic reactivity manifesting. The carbon atom can be, the carbene, carbon atom can be nucleophilic. It can engage with SO2, SO2 here reacting as a electrophile at sulfur, but it can also be, the carbon atom can also be electrophilic. It can engage with CO, where CO is acting as the, the nucleophile. 
and where this reactivity profile manifests itself, I think most nicely is in the Grubbs Catalyst series, which we'll have a whole lecture on. So I won't uh, say too much more about it here. But the reason why folks use Grubbs Catalysts is not because they have the best reactivity in terms of turnover frequency or turnover number of all known metal carbenes. It's because they're highly <coughs> chemoselective for olefins in preference to any other functional group. And why is that? It tends, it arises from the fact that they themselves are macaro olefins. So they are chemoselective for, for this like engaging with like uh, um, mode. Okay, let's um, talk now briefly about how to make metal NHC complexes. And this I'm going to do in an unusual way, which is to brainstorm as a group how to make metal NHC complexes. And we will jot these down. I'm sure we have some ideas as a team. And I'm drawing many arrows because there are many. So now put on your retrosynthetic cap, but your organometallic retrosynthetic cap. So how do we want to make these metal carbene complexes? Let's say just for simplicity's sake that it's a copper one chloride complex or gold one chloride, something like that, relatively simple, monoligated NHC metal. What do we think? Let's throw out some ideas. Carbon the chlorobenazole depregnate with a sufficiently strong base. Beautiful. Alex has got the, what I would say is, is by far, and this doesn't actually have to be, I think you said chloro, but it doesn't need to be chloro. And in some, in some cases, chloro is, is not, not the best. You have the imidazoleum, and then you have associated with it some X-type ligand and then uh, base. And then the metal. Uh, and then plus one oxidation. Metal. Maybe I should, okay. Let me, I'm gonna confuse everybody X and Y here. So let's. Okay, beautiful. Alex, other ideas? We've probably covered 95% of examples right there. So if you're struggling for other examples, you're not, uh, yeah, I'm sure you're not alone. Well, I've never seen it, but could you have a diazo between the two nitrogens, like a urea, like a diazo out of urea? Okay, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, let's, let's try that out. If you had a diazo here, I think your idea here is, is right on point. Let's just draw this as, as you know, generic something. And there are within this realm, there are many different things you could think about. You could think about having a, let's say a, biourea there and desulfurizing. Uh, you could have a urea there and deoxygenate using something very oxophilic. So let me, let me put up two flavors that are two solutions that are along these lines. Here's one case where when you um, heat it up, it will spit out pentafluorobenzene and the corresponding carbon. And then you can also consider the CO2 adduct. This is just using paper. This should be 
plus here. Any other ideas? They're pretty good. We're, we're covering a lot of ground here. Another powerful strategy is to go from metal one to metal two via transmetallation. And this is most commonly done with, with silver. So if your carbene is not stable or it's just not going on efficiently, then you can first pre-associate it to a different metal and then get it onto the metal that you want. And lastly, we'll, we'll bring us to our chemist of the day from, from day. And this is a interesting approach that is a electrochemical approach. So we could imagine using a metal that we want on the NHC as our sacrificial anode. It's going to give up an electron. To our imidazolium salt. Have an electron coming out. We're then going to you just balance stoichiometry here. You see that at the cathode, we're going to need to generate half an equivalent of H2 and then our free carbene. The metal is getting through this process, the metal is getting into the plus one oxidation state as we desire. Uh, single electron reduction of the metazolium precursor uh, is concomitantly generating H2, and then we get out of it our ligated copper one uh, with the same X or Y group that we brought in on the metazolium. Period of curiosity, have you ever yes. seen one generate these from? Corresponding a metazolino and activate the oxygen somehow in some sort of phosphoryl group. And yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that is uh, is a known process with some of the limitations that you might expect needing something very oxophilic for, for activation. I think that's along the lines of what Alex proposed. So our chemist of the day. Is involved in this electrochemical metal NHC generation. And that's Charlotte. Oops. Getting her hands. York. Who uh, completed her education in MCHEM at York and then. Uh, while doing research with a prominent organometallic, uh, Johannes de Vries. 
<laughs> and uh, complete our PhD uh, back at York with uh, Francesca Curtin and Jason Lynham, and then uh, a postdoc with Jonathan Steele at Durham before starting her independent career at York. Um, provide a reference in case anyone is interested in reading more about this. <laughs> okay. Um, let's consider now other multiply bonded uh, metal carbon and metal X species. These I won't talk about in detail just in the interest of, of time and because some of the same principles that we've already covered apply here. So metal uh, complexes doubly bonded to nitrogen are called imidos, and these can exist in two flavors, either bent or linear. The bent imido we consider to be an X2 doubly anionic ligand, which I think just directly falls out as a consequence of, of, of if you this analysis we've done before, we're getting back to a, a closed octet and then balancing charge. And then you will also see a linear amido. I've represented it here in this, in this form, um, but in practice, in publications, you'll often just see this drawn as a metal nitrogen um, triple bond or as a, as a metal nitrogen double bond, but, but with a linear geometry. And so here, the lone pair from uh, on, on nitrogen is sufficiently donating to the metal that it's actually changing the hybridization of the metal from sp2 to sp and those then we count by adding an additional l type interaction so it's overall lx2 six electrons likewise along these lines are nitritos um, which are, are metal nitrogen triply bonded. These are important for processes like N2 um, activation. And those we count as X3, six electron. Now we'll consider metal uh, oxo species. Just in direct analogy to the amidos, you have um, metal oxos that can be best described as doubly bonded and metal oxos that can best be described as triply bonded um, where the oxygen is either sp2 or sp hybridized. So the sp hybridized metal oxo, um, we would just consider x2, four electron and the sp metal oxo, which will often in the literature be drawn with a triple bond. Here's an example shown right, those we will count as LX2, six electrons. And that, that triply bonded character is most common with D0 or D2 metals. Now, a couple further points on oxos. There's a whole branch of organometallic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and bio-inorganic chemistry that deals with metal oxos. These are fundamentally important complexes and intermediates in, in, in biochemical processes. So a lot of work has, has uh, gone into uh, studying their structure and reactivity. I've provided a review here that's uh, somewhat recent that um, because we won't have time in this class to take a deep dive, but this is um, this provides a lot of the, uh, summarize a lot of the important references. And I realized the screen got lost there. It's back. So a couple points is that many metal oxos and amidos um, in in practice are are bridged. We see this especially with like late metal oxos, where often you have bridged species. And in extreme cases, these can even be solid state polymeric or ligomeric materials. And we're familiar with that from the, from the, the, the case of titanium oxide. There's a concept in this area called the oxo wall. This was developed by Harry Gray. The theory was developed by, by Harry Gray, um, which uh, the, the, the theory surrounds this observation that there are no examples known 
of terminal metal oxos for late transition metals uh, with D electron counts beyond five that have a fourfold tetragonal or think octahedral here, extorted octahedral geometry. And that ultimately stems from the um, electronic destabilization that you have when you're trying to fit too many D electrons into these particular geometries with an oxo as part of the ligand field. Here's one example of a metal oxo, and we'll just quickly do the electron counting here so we're familiar with how this works. Uh, this is bearing the, the Tamil ligand developed by Sherry Collins's uh, group. Does anyone want to quickly just shout out the electron counting for this? We have manganese. This is triply bonded oxo, so it's going to be X2L. And then we've got overall minus one charge for X ligands from the Tamil ligand, the nitrogen groups. So overall, that's going to be manganese. What's the oxidation state first? It's six minus charges from the ligands, but then overall minus one. So it would be five. D manganese zero is D seven. And then the overall electron count, one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven ligands times two is 14, plus two from the D2 metal is 16. Good. Nothing we haven't um, seen before in terms of the overall workflow, but just the key point is how we do that accounting for the metal oxo. That's right. If we're using the electron pair definition of coordination number, we would count that as seven electron pairs. Okay, and then to just round out this table, we have a few cases that we considered previously of the Fisher alkylidine. Or sorry, the um, sorry, I'm going a little ahead of myself. Of the vinylidine, which vinylidines are. Uh, always, unless you have further information, you should always consider vinylidines to be of the Fischer type, and that goes to the electronic configuration of non-coordinated vinylidines being uh, strongly favored to be singlet, two electrons, carbonoids, we've been as Fischer type, so they're L, L1, two electron. And then just like with carbenes, when you get to even higher bonding order situations like alkylidines or carbines, these can also exist in the Fischer and Schrock type flavors. And there's nothing really new under the sun here. It's just that we're adding in one additional X when we go from metal carbon double bond to metal carbon triple bond. So now the Fischer alkylidine or Fischer carbine we're treating as LX, Schrock carbine or alkylidine we're treating as X3. The identity of R is also the and it's the exact same. We'll see this when in, in the problem set and probably also on the on the midterm. It's the exact same factors: the metal, the oxidation state of the metal, the flanking ligands, and then this R substituent. And in fact, a lot of the ligand sets and metals will look very familiar from Fischer and Schrock carbene chemistry. And if you're ever not sure and you're asked to do electron counting, you can always do it both ways and explain your reasoning for which you favor in the absence of further information. Okay, let's take a look at now probably day number four from the day seven worksheet. This one.
this would be a good example to illustrate your question, um, Alex. And we can, if I can, oh, there we, go. we can just do a, a quick electron counting exercise of this um, to, to get started. So this asked us to consider a series of these three carbines where the difference is uh, the number of phenyl versus chloro substituents on the phosphorus atom that's attached to the carbine carbon. The ligand here is one you may not have seen before. It's similar in some ways to a CP or CP star ligand. And I think that's why they use this, they, they try to use this similar letter as a TP star. It's a tris uh, parazolol uh, uh, borane ligand. It's overall minus one, and it's gonna be um, have uh, three coordinating sites that are highlighted in gray to the, to the metal. So it's gonna provide six electrons overall. Okay, let's quickly as we're, and, and so we need to consider the CO stretching frequency of this series. Just basically asking as we go, as we swap the X and Y groups here, how the, the CO stretching will respond. But let's first do the electron counting because that came up as a question. Um, so the, anyone wanna walk us through this? We have tungsten at what oxidation state here? NG says two. Okay, we've got minus one from the TP star. And then is this a Fischer or Schrock type carbine? Fischer, so that's gonna be what? LX, so you have X from the TP star, X from the Fischer alkylidine. So you said it was tungsten what? D what? And then overall electron count will be what? Uh, six. How did you how did you get that? When do you have four T electrons and two CO ligands, you have two times two. And so you add the six from the T P star. Okay, anybody get anything different for any, any of these values? We have four from the Fischer carbine, you have six from the TP star, and you have four from the 14, and then you have two because it's the you have you said it's tungsten two, which is D four. So the overall electron count is what? Thank you. Okay, and then let's consider this question um, of the CO stretching frequency. Any volunteers for this one? Dylan, you're looking vaguely in my direction. What do you think? Oh, geez. <laughs> so let's just take this to first principles. Okay. Basically comparing chlorine to carbon, phenyl to chloride. Which of these is more electronegative and going to be more electron withdrawing? Chlorine. Chlorine, okay. So, and and so what would we expect if we consider 
let's consider the extreme of the dichloro case and then the other extreme of the diphenyl case. And then the intermediate will fall out naturally from this. So which of these are you going to expect is going to be more electron withdrawing? The dichloro. Okay. That will have a strong dipole, that will have a weaker dipole. Then let's just think this through. So then do we expect the top or bottom case to be more electron poor metal center? The top would be more electron poor. Top more electron poor. And what will that do in terms of CO striking frequency? Higher frequency. Lower less, frequency. Less back on less back donation. Lower frequency. I, Let's, let's walk it all the way through. No, I, I get this mixed up all the time. So less electron rich metal center, less ability to tie back bond. That means that the CO triple bond will have more triple bond character than double bond character, which would lead to higher frequency. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on that? And then the, the intermediate case is the intermediate. I hope this is obvious. Let me just throw up the reference for this one in case you want to read more about it. And then... That's Alex's recent paper. All right, we will wrap things up. Feel free to stay after if you have any questions. And see you next week. Thanks, everybody.